Our subject this morning is how God prepared the world for the first coming of Christ. This morning I have a text. That text is found in the fourth chapter of the Epistle of Paul to the Galatians, verses 4 and 5. Will you listen? But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. How God prepared the world for the first coming of Christ. Christmas 1960 in America has no parallel in the annals of the history of this world in the extent of the celebration, in the excess of the celebration, and in the expense of the celebration. No Roman holiday or bacchanalian orgy of the past can compare to it. It has rolled upon us again this year like a tidal wave. It is a volcanic eruption of heathen commercialism that drowns mankind already surfeiting in materialism. The bells on the cash registers are the bells of Christmas, and they have been ringing for several weeks now a cacophony of cash. Silent night has been interrupted by stores staying open late to wait on Christmas shoppers. The star of Bethlehem has been blotted out by the gaudy street decoration. O little town of Bethlehem is sung by those going out on the town, and you can be sure it's another town because Bethlehem is Squaresville today. Christmas carols are sung by inebriated celebrants in nightclubs today. And liquor barons have spent millions of dollars to make John Q. Public believe that joy to the world comes in bottles. A deste fidelis no longer means, Oh, come all ye faithful, come, let us adore him, but come eat, drink, and be merry, because half of the world is hungry. Is the world today prepared really to celebrate Christmas? Even in Japan, we were treated to this on television this past week, the department stores have done a land office business selling toys and other Christmas articles, and it's absolutely meaningless in that land. They have Santa Claus, but over 90% in fact, about 98% of the population are Buddhists or Taoists, are Shintoists, and yet they have celebrated Christmas over there. I'm wondering in America today if we have celebrated it in any better way than that. My friend, 1900 years ago, God prepared the world for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The world consciously and unconsciously entered into God's plan. The four corners of the civilized world were made ready for his coming. Oh, I know they forgot to put the welcome mat out, and they went so far in one quarter as even to put up a sign and say, keep off this world. The world then and now is still saying, go home, God. We don't need you. But my beloved, four great ethnic divisions of the human family were made ready for the first coming of Christ. May I mention them? First, the nation Israel. Second, the Oriental races. Third, Greece. Fourth, Rome. 
Each one of these performed his particular part in the coming of Christ into the world. Each one had a separate mission. And when they're all fitted together, you can see that there was a pattern and a design on the part of God when he sent his Son into the world. And that it was when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son. He prepared the world for the coming of his Son. And when you get off 1900 years and look back, and you see that there is one design and one pattern, it should make the most skeptical today, it should make the most cynical today a believer in him. I want us this morning to look at these four divisions of the human family and how each was prepared. I'll take Israel first because it's easiest to see. There's so much of Scripture that deals with the nation Israel in God's plan. And the nation Israel has special significance in the coming of the Savior into the world. It was Kurtz, the great German historian, who said, Judaism prepared salvation for man and heathenism prepared man for salvation. The Lord Jesus Christ said yonder to the woman at the well, Salvation is of the Jews. He was accurate. And Paul, writing to the Romans, said, speaking of who were Israelites, and when he attempted to answer that, he gave eight fingerprints, and one of them was, of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came. He came out of this nation. He came into this world from this nation. And this nation had been prepared for his coming. You go back and you'll find that there are two major divisions in God's preparation of this nation. One is the period of isolation. The other is the period of dispersion. One is the period of segregation. And the other is the period of integration. You say today, is God for integration or is he for segregation? God votes both ways. And there was the period of segregation. There was the period when God reached down, first of all, into Ur of the Chaldees and drew out a man. He said to that man, not only leave your people here in the east, for you must remember that the Jewish people have come out of the east. They belong to that land. They belong to the Orient. And he drew Abraham out of the Tigris-Euphrates Valley, said to him, not only leave this civilization, it was a high civilization in Ur of the Chaldees in those days, not only leave your business and your friends, but I want to get you away from all your relatives. Leave them all. And I'll bring you into the land of Canaan. And he brought him into the land of Canaan, and there you have a period of isolation when God is preparing this man and preparing a race, if you please. You find from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then the twelve sons of Jacob, and down into the land of Egypt they go. There is that brief period of dispersion, four hundred years in the land of Egypt, mixing with those heathen down there and adopting many of their customs. They were just as bad as the Egyptians as far as idolatry was concerned. And then God called Moses and he said, I want you to take my people out of this land. I want you to bring them into the promised land. I want to put them into a very special place. And God took them out, brought them yonder to Mount Sinai. And God says, there's one thing I have in mind, Moses, for these people, that they be a peculiar people. And everything that God gave them was different from the nations round about. If the nations round about went this way, God says to his people, you go that way. I want to keep you separate. And he put them at the crossroads of the world, yonder where three continents mixed. And the most amazing thing is that when the tramp, tramp of the nations of the world went by, 
During that period when they were faithful to God, God kept them a separate people. All that time he was preparing them for the coming of the Savior and preparing a line for his coming into the world. And then you find that they became a sort of a buffer state. The period of dispersion came. And then God sent them back down into the east from whence they came, back to the Tigris-Euphrates Valley to mix with what was then the great nations of the world. They were a buffer state. They rubbed shoulders with the east and they rubbed shoulders with the west. And one of the things that in their period of dispersion that they carried to the world was this, God had said to them, it's the greatest theological statement in the Old Testament, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one Lord. Fifteen millions of nomads, Arabs wandering over the desert today, will listen to a minaret. They say the same thing. They say Allah is one God. Out to a world they gave the message, a world of polytheism. And one of the greatest Greek historians said that when Greece rubbed shoulders with Judaism, polytheism was dead in Greece because they were an intellectual people. And the Greeks would not follow idolatry, having come in contact with Judaism. Down yonder as they went into captivity, they scattered the knowledge of the living and the true God. And from then on, they walked the highways of the world, carrying a pack, doing business, telling out synagogues in every place, Hear, O Israel, Lord your God, Jehovah your Elohim is one Elohim. That was their mission. All was preparation for the coming of the Messiah. Then you come to the period of the prophets. During the period of the prophets, each one of them, as he spoke into a local situation, did not stop there, but each one of them looked down, and when it was darkest, they saw it the brightest. They saw the coming of the Messiah. And they all pointed to his coming, so that when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law. This nation was prepared for the coming of the Messiah. They knew where he was to be born. They should have known when. They believed the Old Testament scriptures that he was coming, but they did not believe that he had arrived. God had prepared them for the coming of the Messiah. The second group, the Oriental races, were prepared. That's where the majority of the population was in that day. It's where the majority of the population is today. I think sometimes I get on the freeway that they're all here, but they're not, my friend. You find them in the Orient. That's where most people are. Daniel saw the interpretation to the vision of Nebuchadnezzar. He saw this image with four different metals, and those four different metals represented four great world powers. To Daniel, that was given privately the four beasts, the four beasts representing the same four nations. Two of those nations are Oriental powers, Hamitic, if you please. Babylon, the head of gold, and Media Persia, the arms and breasts of silver. Both of them are Oriental powers. They represent the Orient, if you please. But 
first great world power was Hamitic. You and I are living in a day when we've seen the ethnological division of the family that's represented by Japheth control the world. I think that he's coming to an end in his rulership of the world shortly. But the head of gold under Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon represented absolute autocracy. It represented a despotic power reposed in one man so that his whim became law. And if he wanted men in a fiery furnace, they went in a fire furnace. Nobody questioned him. Then there was media Persia. Media Persia represents material riches. Probably no nation ever brought together so much of the wealth of the world as media Persia did. The world still stands in amazement at the wealth and the gaudy display of those oriental coats of that day. These two nations represent the Orient, the East, the mysterious East, the land of the Akka, where there are contrasts and where there are contradictions, where side by side for centuries wealth and wretchedness have existed, where squalor and splendor walk hand in hand, where plenty and poverty go together, where the purple and the perishing live in the same town and on the same side of the railroad track. Vast multitudes yonder in the Orient were dying in rags right by the side of great riches. Solomon was their representative also. For Solomon was the one who gathered together the wealth and the wisdom of the world. And Solomon made this statement, speaking for them, He that trusteth in his riches shall fall. Proverbs eleven twenty eight. May I say to you, the East went down rich. Will Rogers said when we entered the Depression. He says America is the only nation on record that's going to the poorhouse in a Cadillac. If he was wrong, he did not know history. That was true of the Orient. They went, if you please, to the poorhouse in purple and with gold and silver in that day, but the gold and silver could not save them. Abraham had come out of Ur of the Chaldees, out of that mysterious land, and in captivity they went back into that land and some never came out. When the nations of the East lost their power, the East was like a dead battery that was run down. The ragged religions of that land didn't help any. They offered no hope. Zoroastrianism, Buddhism, Hinduism, Confucianism, Taoism, Shintoism offered no help or hope for them. At the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Orient was perishing, and there was a great longing in the hearts of the miserable mobs of the East, and an air of expectancy had spread throughout the world. Suetonius, the Latin historian, says, an ancient and definite expectation had spread throughout the East that a ruler of the world would at that time arise in Judea. And Tacitus, the Roman historian, says the same thing. And Schlegel, the German historian, states that Buddhist missionaries traveling to China met Chinese sages going to seek the Messiah about 33 A.D. Paul was saying no idle word when he said yonder to the Roman king, this thing was not done in a corner. We find that yonder on the day of Pentecost that there were Parthians and Medes in Jerusalem. The East was represented. It was an Ethiopian eunuch 
out of the dark continent of Africa that heard the word, the first Gentile converted, and it said of him, he went on his way rejoicing. He took the gospel into Africa. Thomas, that doubting apostle, did not go to the Roman Empire. There is an abundance today of historical evidence that he went into India and even into China. It was out of that wretched and miserable East that there came to Jerusalem wise men. Out of the mysterious East where men were suffering and dying and they said, where is he that's born king of the Jews? We've seen his star in the East. We've come to worship him. In the fullness of the time, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law. The Orient had been made ready. May I turn to the third ethnological division, the Greeks. The Greeks are the third world power that Daniel mentions. The Greco-Macedonian civilization was one of the greatest civilizations this world has seen. The basic philosophy of Greece was a striving to get the perfect man. They tried to perfect man, bring him to the place of physical and mental perfection. They didn't do much spiritually, but they certainly worked on it physically and mentally. The Greek gave genius to the world, as no nation has. At the time that David was singing the sweet psalms of Israel, just a few miles away yonder in Asia Minor, Homer the poet was walking in rags singing his story. And as someone has said, he went into 25 towns that would not give him bread that afterward claimed him as being the one born there. Then several hundred years went by, and about the third century before Christ, in the Periclean age, Greece threw upon the horizon of history a glory of Greece that covered the Acropolis and ran down to the ends of the earth, so much so today that it has affected every walk of life, even architecture. And you can't build today a Baptist church or a courthouse that does not in some way reflect upon the genius of the Greeks. It was during that period that Socrates, Demosthenes, Plato, Xenophon, Sophocles, Euripides appeared, all of them geniuses in their line. Philosophy and poetry and drama and athletics and government was carried to the highest, the nth degree in this particular period. And then came Alexander the Great out of Macedon, uniting the Greek states for the first time and marching an army over the world to do something God wanted done. I want to give you today Halson's statement. Will you listen? He took up, speaking of Alexander, he took up the meshes of the net of civilization which were lying in this order on the edges of the Asiatic shore, spread them over all the countries which he traversed in his wonderful campaigns. The East and the West were suddenly brought together. Separated tribes were united under a common government. New cities were built as the centers of political life. New lines of communication were opened as the channels of commercial activity. The new culture penetrated the mountain ranges of Pisidian Laconia. The Tigris and Euphrates became Greek rivers. The language of Athens was heard among the Jewish colonies of Babylonia, and a Grecian Babylon was built by the conqueror in Egypt and called by his name. May I say to you that he took a civilization to the ends of the earth. And may I say that he accomplished a purpose. 
for God was scattering a language that was to become the vehicle of the gospel. That was the Greek language for every book of the New Testament was written in Greek. And that most amazing of all apostles, Paul could stand yonder in the Agora in Corinth, or on Mars Hill in Athens, or yonder in the amphitheater in Ephesus, or in the Mamertine prison in Rome. He could speak one language, and he was a master at it. You read his epistle to the Romans. He knew the Greek language. He could stand there and preach a gospel that was heard by all. God had prepared the Greeks for the coming of Christ into the world at just the right moment, if you please. The Old Testament had previously been translated in Egypt by this 70 called the Septuagint. Old Testament put in Greek, and it's one of the best of the translations that we have today. And Luke wrote his gospel to the Greek world, and he said to them, You have been seeking all these years for the perfect man. I present him to you, the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm a doctor. I looked at him physically. He grew physically in favor with God and man. He grew a normal person down here upon this earth. But I looked at him, said Dr. Luke, he was a perfect man. He died upon a cross for the sins of the world. He was raised again. And you find that Paul, when he took that gospel throughout that Roman world that could speak and understand Greek, he could write the last thing he could write. Only Luke is with me. The man had put his stethoscope down on Jesus Christ and said to the Greek world, You never found the perfect man, but here he is. In the fullness of the time, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman born under the law. I come to the last. God prepared the Romans for the coming of Christ. And when Caesar Augustus put his name to a tax bill, had you told him that he was nothing in the world but a little puppet on a chessboard carrying out God's wishes, he laughed at you. But you've got to get 1,900 years away and look back to see that. He couldn't see it. That's what he was. But Rome was the empire of iron. Their philosophy was one word, power. Power. Again, I'd like to give you a quotation from Gregory concerning Rome, because I'm afraid it's misunderstood today, and we ought to know something about Rome in this hour, because you see, Rome didn't die. Rome lives today. Does this sound familiar to you? The Roman was to try another solution of the problem. He was to try whether human power, taking the form of law, regulated by political principles of which a regard for law and justice was most conspicuous, could perfect humanity by subordinating the individual to the state and making the state universal. Hitler, Mussolini, Stalin, communism were not the first to try of making the state a sovereign and even a god. Rome did that. What a tremendous thing. Will you look at Rome for just a moment? With physical force, the Roman conquered the world. With his executive power, he organized it, or he was an organizer. He gave good government, that is, if you can call it good government, to every people, tribe, and nations, for he conquered the world. He built roads. He gave them good roads. God saw to that, because over those roads, 
The gospel was to go to the hinterland. And he was to give law and order, and law and order prevailed. You look in Jerusalem, read your Gospels again, and see how law and order prevailed in Jerusalem. Roman soldiers were there to see that they had law and order. That was the thing that Rome gave to the world. And the one thing that they emphasized was justice. May I be pardoned if I give you one more quotation? Listen to this now. It was justice, practically omnipotent and omnipresent, and so neither to be resisted nor escaped. Justice which never dreamed of mercy until the work of conquest and consolidation was done. It made men long for mercy because it demonstrated to them that there was no hope for them in righteous law. What a picture. What a picture. They held up justice. And all over the Roman Empire, which covered the world in that day in three continents, all the way from the pillars of Hercules to the Euphrates River, all the way from the cold mountains of Scotland down to the burning sands of the Sahara Desert, there was law. There was that Roman judge like Pilate. And on his desk there was the image of Janus. We get our word January from him, the two-headed God. He looks both directions. He sees both sides. And Rome said to every people, we'll not destroy your customs. You go right on living your own life. Only one thing. We're going to run things. We run things. And we'll give you justice. Every one of you can come and have justice. Because every Roman court stood for that. Isn't it an anomaly? Isn't it ironical that Jesus Christ was crucified on a Roman cross? A nation that boasted of justice. And I want to tell you that by the time that Paul the Apostle, that little Jew crippled and almost blinded, started down those Roman roads, speaking Greek to a world that could listen to him. Here is one of the things that this man said. Oh, it's so important. He said, I have obtained mercy. The world was tired of justice. And you know, when most people today say, as a man said to me in Altadena many years ago, on his deathbed, you let me alone, preacher. All I ask of God is justice. I said, wait a minute, is it really justice that you want or mercy? And he finally had to admit, really, what he wanted was mercy. You see, we've got mercy and justice mixed up today. Justice condemns you. The law condemns you. And the law was given that every mouth might be stopped and the whole world become guilty before God. And by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. You mean the Mosaic law? No. I mean any law. By deeds of not the Mosaic law, but by deeds of any law, Roman law. Paul went out into the Roman world. He wrote the Romans and he said, by the deeds of law, no flesh is justified. And that's the reason that Roman world down under the heel of Rome, hearing nothing but justice, and they were crying out not for justice, but for mercy. And Paul came and said to them, what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his only Son in the likeness of sin for flesh, condemned sin in the flesh. But now, by grace, are ye saved through faith. Not by works. Not by works. Oh, not by works, but by grace. And out over that Roman Empire, 60 million slaves, 60 million free men, but they were not free. They were under Roman law. 
They all sighed for a salvation that could deliver them. In the fullness of the time, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law. The world today is just as needy as it was 1900 years ago. Honestly, we haven't come very much, very far in 1900 years, only technologically. Today there's plenty and there's poverty. America has a headache with an abundance, a surplus. And on this Christmas day in India and in China, where the multitudes and most of the population of the world is, last night, Christmas Eve night, they went to bed with an empty stomach. And my friend, it won't be filled on this Christmas day. The world is just as needy, just as wretched. The Jew was the man of prophecy. Matthew wrote to him and gathered up the Old Testament prophecies and said, Here he is, the Messiah. The Orient is the man of plutocracy and the man of poverty. The man that says, though I may have pearls and I may have gold and I may have diamonds and I can get in the scales and I can put diamonds on the other side to match them in my way. Yet that man is still hungry, and he's still thirsty today. And the Gospel of John was written for him, and John quotes our Lord when he says, I am the bread of life, I am the water of life, and if any man hunger, if any man thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. The Greek was the man of perfection. A man of philosophy, Dr. Luke, wrote and said, Look, here he is, perfect man. The Roman was the man of power, the man of politics. Mark wrote, brief gospel, the saint, the cattle, one miracle right after another, he's the man of action. But the world is needy again. Idealism is all but dead in the world today, and all America's produced is a bunch of beatniks. Mankind is bankrupt today intellectually. There's not a leader in the world today that's outstanding. Not a one. You can talk about your Harvard graduates all you want to. Bunch of beatniks intellectually. Not an outstanding man in the world today. And one of the modern writers said of literature, this is modern literature, and in Hollywood they like to think they're intellectual. They are not intellectual, they are sophisticated. This is her estimation. She says, modern literature is a mirror on the ceiling of a brothel. What a picture. And the United Nations in the realm of government this morning is broke and powerless and can't even handle a few Stone Age natives who this morning are using spears and bows and arrows, and we have atomic bombs. Can't solve the problems of the world today. What sham and sham. I say to you this morning in these four Gospels is the man, Christ. Jesus, God, who took upon himself human flesh. And this Christmas day he can meet your need. Are you hungry? Are you thirsty? Are you tired of life? A young lady on the telephone said to me not long ago, if you don't give me a reason, I intend to take my own life. 
May I say to you, are you tired of life today? Maybe you've been looking in the wrong places. Maybe you've been going to the wrong places. Maybe you're listening to the wrong things. I point you this Christmas day to Jesus Christ, who still is the Savior of the world. I close. It's black outside right now. I know it. You don't have to tell me that. Men in high places today are pessimistic about the future. They have no hope. My friend, on this Christmas Day, I have some good news for you. There's a little glimmer of light breaking on the horizon right now. And it shows up brighter because it's so dark down here. This one, who came 1,900 years ago, is coming again, and I'm willing to risk being called a fanatic in saying, I think God's preparing the world right now for his return. He's coming again. That's the hope of the world today. I'm not here to applaud a baby. I'm not here to celebrate the birth of a baby. I'm here on this Christmas day to point you to the mighty Son of God, the Savior of the world, and the only one that can meet your need in this world. Shall we pray? I've taken in a lot of time this morning. I trust you will forgive me, but I'll let you out of here now in just a brief moment. And will you stay with us this Christmas day? I'm wondering, do I dare on this Christmas day believe that you come in here without this Savior and you don't know him? That Christmas is, after all, a pretty shallow sort of a thing for you. You like the idea of giving gifts and receiving them, but you've never yet received God's gift, the gift of his Son. I'm wondering this morning, friend, right where you're sitting, heads bowed as we pray today, if you'd like to just lift your hand and say, Preacher, on this Christmas day, I'd like to receive the greatest gift of all. I'd like to receive Christ. Maybe in the past you haven't been sure whether you received him. My friend, when you walk out of here today, you can know whether he is your Savior or not. Are you here today? Would you like to just open your heart on this Christmas day? Oh, it's easy to become sentimental if there wasn't room for him in the end. But what about your heart? What about your life?